I mentioned Lockie Neal. So it's bubbling away still. We know he uh, considered, as per the reports from Ryan Daniels out west, that move to uh, Fremantle. That was absolutely true. He since walked away from that. And we thought everything was all dead and buried there with Lockie Neal. Um, and look, I'm not in the interests of um, shooting down other journalist stories. It's not why we're around. It's hard. No, that fact from fiction can be hard to sort out. I'm only telling you the conversations I've had with a few people in the inner circle of this particular situation this morning, and uh, they are livid that it's been brought back up. In fact, they say there is absolutely no chance. If they could say less than zero chance, they would have as put to me very directly, very forcefully, as I say, by those close to this, that there is no way Lockie Neal is leaving the Brisbane Lions. He can put it to bed. He's totally committed. And look, the inner sanctum when it comes to this acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of secrecy. We don't know the full facts, why things came to fruition the way they did initially. They're not willing to elaborate on them, that on the moment, but they say, take it to the bank. There is no chance Lockie Neal is leaving. It is dead and buried. So I thought I'd bring that to you um, as it stands. I mentioned Callum Coleman-Jones. This is one, you know, for all the talk about Jordan Dawson when it comes to the trade period being bogged down, this is absolutely gloves off stuff at the moment. So it was reported yesterday that the Kangaroos opening move to get Callum Coleman-Jones, Richmond's ruck forward in the door, saw them offer a future third round pick. That's right. My understanding is that North Melbourne actually also asked for Richmond's fourth round pick in return, which is a fair play, isn't it? Bold play. Richmond clearly want more for a 22-year-old. They've invested four years development into since taking him with pick 20 in the draft of 2017. But at the same time, as we know, Coleman Jones has been selected for only nine games in those four years. In fact, eight of them came this year. But the Tigers correctly, again, point to the fact that North have offered uh, their player a four-year contract worth around $450,000 a season. So they're saying... The trade proposal doesn't match the contract that Callum Coleman-Jones has agreed to. The Roos, for their part, they want to use Coleman-Jones as their primary ruck weapon this year. And and my understanding is that the veteran Todd Goldstein will relinquish the number one ruck role to make that happen. But as things stand, the two clubs remain a long way apart in negotiations. Although, of course, there is plenty of time until Wednesday's trade deadline. Robbie Tarrant, that move from North Melbourne to Richmond, on a two-year deal, would normally be a fait accompli as an unrestricted free agent. That's still likely to eventuate via a trade, given the Marby or Child compensation that Richmond would clearly want to preserve. North Melbourne will take Jason Orn Francis at, at pick one in next month's national draft. They also have picks 20, 40, 72, and 77. Richmond, they've got the best hand in the draft. 7, 15, 26, 28, 38, 42. The list goes on and on. The Tigers are also in the hunt for the Dogs' first-round pick at the moment. They might have some competition for that. It is pick 17, and the Dogs looking clearly to position themselves to weather bids on father-son tall Sam Darcy. So they're looking to pull a similar move to the Pies, get those um, third-round picks in, fourth-round picks in, get a glut of those in to match uh, any bid for Sam Darcy, son of Luke, that might come early in the top handful of selections in the draft. Darcy McPherson was a unique trade prospect, wasn't he? He was going to be going down to North Melbourne. Now, this was reported as a salary dump from Gold Coast, and the deal would have had the contracted McPherson and pick 19 sent to North Melbourne if the Kangaroos footed the bill for the last year of McPherson's back-ended contract by obviously smoothing it, it out over a couple more years. The only problem is that Darcy McPherson is refusing a trade to North Melbourne as things stand, and we've got a few more details on this proposed move. So this isn't merely a salary dump, as we initially suspected, because we probably weren't privy to all the details. The other details are that North Melbourne would hand over future picks back to the Suns. We know Gold Coast have no interest in um, in hoarding picks for this year's draft. They'll use the minimum three or upgrade a rookie and such, but they've got no interest in uh, getting picks in the door this year. Next year, though, a different proposition. So this wouldn't just be McPherson and 19 to North Melbourne and that's it, pay the wage. It would be a proper trade. And sources said the Suns' motivation for trading McPherson this morning wasn't purely salary cap related. They are, in fact, happy to retain the player for 2022. His lucrative contract as well has attracted some criticism, McPherson, but it is back-ended in composition, and those AFL-mandated pay deferrals have inflated it for next year, but it's next year only, the third and final season of his deal. He did finish third in Gold Coast 2019, best and fairest, Darcy McPherson, but... The reason for the trade being possible is the club simply no longer see him in their best 22. So they're happy to consider a trade, 
but the Suns have never told other clubs they need to dump money. So North Melbourne, for their part, they haven't finalised a contract offer for him either as yet. Suns midfielder, though, is determined to stay in Queensland and fight for his spot under Stuart Jew. That may or may not be the right decision, but that's the way things stand at the moment for Darcy McPherson. He wants to stay at the Gold Coast. Things can always change, but that's how it sits at the moment. Bit of interest in Sam Palpepa and also Petrovsky seaton for West Coast. We know that is going to happen. I don't mind it from West Coast because they don't have a lot of hands to play with their lack of draft picks that they've had and also the age of their list. And they don't have a lot to give up. But if you can get two 23-year-olds that can play a role in for West Coast, I like what they're doing. Whether they can pull it off is another thing, Riley. Yeah, it's an interesting one because... You speak to people at the Eagles, and I think the starting point in their negotiations with Sam Petrescu Seaton might be well beyond what what Carlton thought they might be, and and whether or not the Blues thought they might get a second round pick. I think that might be fanciful now. I think maybe it's it's looking like it might be either fifty two or sixty eight, one of those mm, two picks for Sam Petrescu Seaton, which is, I mean, a year ago his value was much higher. He had a, a pretty mm. poor twenty twenty one season, and that's seen his value plummet. So it's unfortunate for the for the Blues and for Petrescu Seaton, but yeah, they'll. They'll get him on the board. I think he's their first priority. I look at West Coast and think, though, that they need speed. They need leg speed from halfback and outside run. That's what I think lacked last year. They were a bit too stop-start in the way they went about their footy building from the back. I just don't see any of those players helping that issue, whether or not Adam Simpson and internally they think their their problems are elsewhere and they think they need bigger-bodied midfield support. That's another question. And obviously, if they do land both Petrovsky Seaton and Pal Pepper in this year's trade period, they must think that they need more inside midfield support, which is interesting because mm. a lot of clubs have sort of gone in a different direction and, and are thinking that they don't need that. They need more runners and they need more um, leg support on the outside. So it's an interesting direction. I'm keen to see whether or not they follow through on this Pal Pepper interest. How do Carlton players, a couple of uh, Carlton um, fans uh, uh, fallen off their chair reading pick 52 has been offered for Petrovsky mm. Seaton, who was a pick six. How do they play it then, the Blues? Like, he, he's already gone home. He's clearly... He's out. He's emotionally out. The, the chat with Michael Voss just clearly didn't have any impact on him whatsoever. And that offer is there. It's, it's take it or leave it. it, it th- th- there's not, nothing they can really do, can they, the Blues? They can ask for more. I mean, if you're asking me, yes, he had a bad 2021 season, but he's a player that's played 90-odd games in five mm. years. So I think one of those picks, 29 or 35, and maybe it's 35 because it's the later one, I, I think that probably is a suitable trade. But... I'm just not sure if it's a player West Coast necessarily need. I think they've they've they're going to do the deal. Like they want more forward half class on the ball, so it makes sense from their perspective. But they're they're well stocked as well. They haven't gone to a draft in a long time. They're well stocked for picks. So they, they, you can see why they're saying to themselves, "Well, this is a player who you didn't play last year. You had the opportunity to play him in a range of different spots because he's played forward, he's played midfield, and he's played on half back, and you chose not to. So why should we be offering anything more? So you can kind of see it from both perspectives. But that's what sort of the beauty and the, the ugliness of trade periods all about. We get, we get mm. 10, 12 days of haggling because clubs see it differently. A lot of clubs um, like talking down the players they're about to bring in. A lot of clubs like talking up the players they're about there or they're willing to lose. So it's an interesting little period. But yeah, it's hard to see a resolution there.